I can hear you, you know. What's he doing? Draped on the front of a classic cruiser, pretending he's an advert for a 1950s holiday on the broads. Well, I'll tell you, this is my new series, Riddles of the River. This series, I'll be right up the creek. No change there, then. I'll be exploring the history of some of our rivers and asking you some tricky questions along the way. Now, we're starting on the Norfolk Broads. Of course, you don't need me to tell you that the Broads are awash with history, but I'm not going to dish it up to you on a plate. Oh, no. You'll have to tease it out of me by trying to answer the riddles that the rivers wash up. So, here's your first riddle. What's the connection between a boy's name and the large water-filled holes in the ground that we know and love as the Norfolk Broads? And if you think that's too easy, don't get cocky. This is only the first question. For centuries, people assumed that the Broads were a natural phenomenon, that they'd been the gift of nature. And a lot of people still think that but they're not. So just how did the Broads get to be here? Back in the 50s and 60s, Dr Joyce Lambert had been collecting soil samples for a study of Broadland's vegetation. And that's how she quite accidentally discovered just how the Broads had got to be there. She realised they'd been dug by man. Of course, not everyone was happy to be told that what they believed was a glorious natural wilderness had actually been deliberately excavated by medieval men with iron-tipped wooden spades. OK, that's the hole in the ground bit. The broads were flooded pits, but why were they dug? Well, that's where the boy's name comes in. Getting warm yet? That's another clue, by the way. The answer you'll find up at Howe Hill, under the mantelpiece at Toad Hole Cottage. In the course of, what, probably no more than two centuries, Norfolk labourers excavated nine million square feet of peat from the landscape. Turves of peat, just like this one. Nine million square feet. In one year alone, Norwich Cathedral, well, some authorities say they used 200,000 of these in their kitchens, and another authority says 400,000. Whichever one of them is right, that's an enormous amount of peat just going into Norwich Cathedral kitchen. The demand for this stuff was enormous. And they met the demand. And they left rather large holes in the landscape doing it. And that's how the Norfolk Broads got to be where they are. You only got to be in Roxham for five minutes to be able to work out just how this place makes its money. The pounds come rolling in through hiring boats out to the holiday makers. But have you ever stopped to wonder just why and how this small Norfolk village ended up being the very heart of the Norfolk Broads boating industry? And just who was it that had the bright idea all those years ago? His name was John Moynes. Oh, and Johnny, did you know what you were getting us into? He started out in 1878 with a single rattly old rowing boat, but his customers had an annoying habit of leaving those boats up in Roxham, and eventually that's where he tied up as well. In 1907, a London businessman sailed into the picture when Harry Blake hove into view, the Broads was well and truly open for business, the leisure and pleasure business.
Now, here's a testing little riddle for you. What do you think the possible connection might be between the River Nile, this isn't, by the way, just in case you were wondering, Roxham Bridge and English Mustard, and uh, rich folks swanning about on the Norfolk Broads at the turn of the century. By the time of the first war, there were a hundred pleasure wherries on the water. White sailed, polished brass, pink gins on the deck pleasure wherries. And Hartor was one of them. She was built for the Coleman family, as in mustard. And they had a brother, the two sisters it was built for had a brother who was suffering from TB. And um, they shipped him off to Egypt where they hoped the dry, clean air of the south would uh, help him improve. <laughs> the whole family went out there and his dying wish was to see something on the Nile. And they embarked on one of the Dahabas, the sailing boats on the Nile, which happened to be called Hartor. And when she was moored at Luxor, Alan Coleman died and surrounded by his family. And then some seven or eight years later, when the two sisters were having a wherry built, commissioned, um, they decided to build it in memory of him. So not only do we have here a traditional Norfolk wherry with a very Egyptian name, but the interior is fitted out in Egyptian style with all the weird and wonderful hieroglyphics. <laughs> I mean, did the sisters sail or did they just act as passengers? Oh, my goodness me, they were just, just sat there. Oh, right, they, they, they would do nothing, um, not even making a cup of tea because everything would have been done by the skipper and the steward. Everybody who came on the vessels, certainly in Edwardian times, you'll notice were always wearing immaculate whites, and if they started to get involved, I'm afraid their whites wouldn't stay white for very long. <laughs> When the Coleman sisters commissioned Hartor, their most specific specification was that the wherry must be able to get under the bridges at Potter Hyam and Roxham. Now, it was always a tight fit, but changing water levels has made life very interesting for today's skipper. What you need, he told me, is huge amounts of ballast. In the old days, probably they would have um, sort of poured water in the bilges or the put loads of uh, sacks on. Today, you wake the boat down, get some people on board, wait her down, get through that way. Yeah, want the ten fattest people on the bank, please. <laughs> it's a bit difficult going up to someone and say, we want you for your body, but basically, <laughs> basically it's a good idea, yes. Perhaps I could do that. That would be. I a... was nearly going to say something. Say that, 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 I didn't that, that, I wish like to be that, rude I, yeah. in public. <laughs> Norfolk's medieval church towers, well, tower above the flat landscapes, but Thurn Tower has got something a little bit special. Do you know, I love getting into the nooks and crannies at the backs and corners of churches, because that's often places like this where there's been very little done over the centuries so you'll find some original features look at this one that's a genuine medieval hole in the wall all right don't get too excited what was it used for well there's a long tradition in the village that this was used to warn the monks of St Bennet's of approaching danger that when there was a Danish raid coming up the river They'd hang a lantern in here and it would act like a spotlight and alert the monks. Great legend, total tosh. The tower was built hundreds of years after the time of the Viking raids on this coastline. 
And if you were going to do that anyway, you'd shove it up the top where someone could see it, not down at the bottom of the tower. But it's a great little legend. There's another one as well, but we need to go outside to look at that. And the other oft-told tale relating to holes in the walls of churches? Well, this is supposed to be where lepers would gather to be able to watch the service inside the church, safely sanitised and cut off from their brethren inside. Total tosh too. If you want to know what I think this probably was used for, come outside and I'll show you. In the Middle Ages, bells weren't always hung in the towers. Sometimes you would have them in bell coats, detached bell coats at the back of the tower, big wooden structures at ground level. Now, there were two occasions in the medieval mass when it was essential to ring the bells. One was the sanctus, but the other, the most important of all, the crisis of the whole ceremony was when the priest consecrated the bread and the wine and turned them into the body and blood of Christ. He elevated the host above his head and at the moment that he did that, the bells had to be rung. Bong, bong, bong. And I think that this was where one of the bell teams stood with a direct line of sight to the altar so that he could do that and all his mates could ring those bells. I think that this is a medieval bell coat squint. Riddle, what goes round and round in circles and is full of wind? Careful, windmills. This is Clayrack Mill. This was actually built in 1870 to drain the marshes around Ranworth Broad. Now it was dismantled and brought here to Howe Hill, restored, placed here in the, the reserve, where they just as carefully restored it to its full working order. So they tell me, and I hope they're telling me the truth, because I would love to see how this thing actually works. OK, not a riddle, straight question, multiple choice. Four types of mills for anyone would show you. There's your power mill, horse, tis mill, hop -hop mill, and a trail mill. What can this one is? This is Amanda, who's actually a, a world expert 
on drainage pumps and drainage mills. Well, she knows more about them than I do, which is why she's doing it, put it that way. <laughs> why did you restore this drainage pump? Well, if I can just correct you there, they're actually uh, drainage mills um, because they, they move water, they don't actually pump water. Really? Yes. Oh, well, then you see, every day's a school day, you learn something new every day. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it's known as a hollow post mill, and there's only two left in Norfolk. They used them generally during the winter. Um, the summer water level in the marsh dropped, so they were able to cattle on the marshes. During the winter, the water levels rose, so they needed to pump the water off the marshes. Um, to keep them dry. How many of them would there have been in their heyday? There was about 240. Gosh, as many as that? Yeah, yeah, sort of. Because this one, I mean, being a timber mill, could be moved about. Where, you can, that's and then right, they take it apart. Yeah. Take it apart, move it to the other side of the river and use it again. Um, whereas some of the other ones, the brick towers, were permanent structures. So what do you reckon? Are we going to get this going? I should think so. Yeah? Yeah, I think the wind's strong enough. <laughs> you have a gift for understatement, I can see. <laughs> what happens if it gets out of control? Does it just sort of lift off across the field? <laughs> well, I hope it doesn't do that. One, two, three. Right, how do you start a windmill? Well, a little brute force, and in my case, huge amounts of ignorance. This one? Shaking. Yes! Norfolk marshmen have gathered in the harvest of reed and sedge on the broads for centuries. Marshmen not so very different from Eric Edwards. Eric learned his trade from a marshman, who learned his trade from a marshman, and you get the picture, right the way back through time. Back all the way to the time of the Vikings. And that's my next riddle. In what way do you think the Danish invaders made the Norfolk marshman's heavy burden just a little lighter? However, did a marshman get a living? Well, I'd imagine reed cutting in the winter time, sedge cutting in the summertime. In between, in the winter time, they'd probably do, if it was a wet day, they'd do a bit of diking. God, that don't bear thinking about, does it, working mm. in a dike on a, no. a winter's day? Well, they were good old boys, they were good tradesmen years ago. They knew how to handle tools. I mean, most old boys could mow with old sides. Today, we lost that, you see. You look like a man who's about to show me how to dress some reed. Yeah, I'll show you how it's done, Brian. Good. Have an old rake and old drones and board look. Very important to dress reed. Clean. You make it look so deceptively easy. Yeah, that's... Well, it'll take years to learn. You know, once you've tied them for a year or two, it becomes easy. Look at that lovely hard stub on there, look. You know, good hard bit of stub. It's on top of my head. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful bit of reed, that is. Beautiful bit of reed. And as I say, can last a lifetime, as we say in Norfolk. Good Norfolk reed. Quite proud of that. And they live a long while in Norfolk. Yeah, they do. Good ear. <laughs> good beer as well. Yes. <laughs> the reed harvest is still transported by water and the perfectly formed, satisfyingly practical lines of Eric's boat, oh, right. his purpose-built boat, are those of the traditional Broad's Reed lighter. Yeah, we get uh, a couple of hundred on every one. Couple of hundred, couple really? Couple of hundred, 250. Last. Yeah. yeah, they hold a fair bit of weight, the old lighter. 
But where did this boat come from? The Norfolk Reed Lighter is a direct descendant of the clinker-built longships that brought the Viking invaders across the North Sea. The Vikings invented the idea of building boats from overlapping planks, clinker-built construction, the same construction that's the hallmark of the Norfolk Reed Lighter. West Somerton sits slap in the middle of six of the broads and its church dominates the surrounding landscape just like one of its parishioners did back in the reign of Queen Victoria. Now what do you think might possibly be the connection between Phileas T. Barnum, the undisputed king of the Fairground attraction, Her Imperial Highness Queen Victoria, and a gentleman of somewhat princely proportions, late of this parish? Well, the answer is a gentleman who would have had to duck to get underneath this rude screen. A resident of this parish by the name of Robert Hales. And at seven foot eight inches tall and 33 stone in weight, he more than deserved his popular nickname, the Norfolk Giant. He earned his living as a wherry boy and his skipper cut a hole in the bulkhead so Robert could lie down in his bunk. But the tragedy was he actually wanted to join the Royal Navy and go away to sea because he actually managed to do that later in life. But of course, the Admiralty, as you'd probably expect, took a pretty dim view of people cutting holes in the bulkheads of their nice shiny new ships. So Robert was discharged. And that was a, a tragedy for him because it meant he couldn't follow the way of life he'd long wanted to. More importantly, it forced him to take a step he'd long wanted to avoid. He and his sister, in order to earn their keep, went out on the road. They became a fairground attraction in a Victorian fair. What you and I and what they knew as a freak show. In 1848, the famous American fairground entrepreneur Phineas T. Barnum made Robert a fabulous offer. He cannily held out for a better one, and when he got it, it was bye-bye old Norfolk and hi, New York. So where does Queen Victoria fit in? Well, Robert's American tour made him a real celebrity. When he returned, he was presented with a gold watch by Queen Victoria and Prince Albert, and his future never looked brighter. Sadly, ill health forced him off the road. He ended his days trying to scratch a living by selling penny copies of stories of his life to passers-by on Gentleman's Walk and on the seafront at Yarmouth. And it was probably because of that, out in the open air in all weathers, that he eventually contracted bronchitis, which deepened into pneumonia, and that's what killed him. He was brought back and buried in the churchyard of the church where he'd been baptised. <coughs> Right, next week the Orwell and one of the fastest warships afloat. Rowing for the shore in a smuggler's tale and exploring a very tall tower that's at the heart of some very tall stories. See you next week. <laughs>